All right, guys, so this is the second part of the probe setup. Um, as you can see, I've got a one inch, this is a precision ground gauge pin. Uh, I'm holding it with a V block, precision ground V block, and I've got a um, parallel up so it doesn't offset. The parallel and the uh, V block are the same height. So I'm trying not to introduce any tilt error. So I've got the probe loaded up, plugged in, and I'm centered over the uh, gauge pin that we're going to use as our calibration uh, constant. So then what I'm going to do, and this is for probe basic, I'm not sure, I know Acorn has a different method, I think Tormach has a different method. Um, for setting the calibration up in the software once you've got the mechanical calibration completed. I'm not sure what all those are. I haven't used them personally, uh, mainly because I built Pro Basic and, well, that's what I use. <laughs> in Pro Basic, what we've done is I've, I've built in a calibration uh, uh, tab on the interface for probing. And basically what we do is we put a calibration uh, diameter in here, and then you've got various buttons. So this would be for a boss. This would be for a internal calibration ring. And this is the uh, offset. This takes into account the diameter of the Ruby stylus, or in my case, it's a, a tungsten stylus. And this calculates the trigger distance when the probe makes contact and tra traverses over the top of the gauge pin and makes contact on the other side, it takes the known diameter of the gauge pin, which is one inch, and the uh, diameter of the stylus tip, and then it calculates um, the trigger distance. And then once the calibration is run, that is added into the, uh, the probing routines. So I'm gonna go ahead and clear this out since we just did a mechanical calibration. I've got all these cleared. Um, I'm, I am zeroed, I did a rough zero before the calibration just to help expedite everything. Uh, I've moved over to probe position. What this button does is it's not going to set the work offsets. They're already set at zero and it's at a 0.1 uh, Z clearance after it, oops, sorry about that, after it uh, makes contact, it raises up to 0.1. So we've cleared this out. I'm going to use the XY average. That means it's going to average the error between X and Y. It seems to be the easiest for everyone to use. And we're going to go ahead and start this up. And what we've come up with is 0 0.002013. So we're good on this page. What I'm going to go ahead and do now is go over to Boss and Pockets. I'm going to reset all the probing data. And we've got our diameter hint. I'm going to go ahead and run a regular Boss probe. If everything is good, we should come up with uh, very close to 1, 1, and should be real close to uh, 0 here.
Okay, so this looks pretty good. We've got a probed X width of 0.9998, so we're two thousandths off, and 0.9999 for Y. Um, I think these were off before because we didn't reset after we calibrated. But let's do a repeatability test. Uh, we just zeroed these out, and now what we're going to do is we're going to rerun the test and see. Oh, sorry. We just zero these out. We're going to rerun the test and uh, we'll reset our probing data. And we'll see what the repeatability is now. Okay, so we're within one tenth in repeatability, and looks like it's just a little bit undersized. What we could probably do is rerun the calibration if we wanted to try and, you know, uh, get a little bit better. Um, but honestly, I, I'm not going to mess with that. That's 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 perfectly within any tolerance I'm trying to accomplish. So hopefully that gives you an idea of the process for setting up the Drewtronics probe, um, especially if you're using Probe Basic. Uh, like I said, the results that I've gotten using this probe have just, they've been nothing short of fantastic. Uh, if you do find that you're getting not these results, um, Honestly, recheck your mechanical calibration. Recheck, uh, make sure that when you're putting the probe in the spindle, you're not getting a, a huge deviation from your original mechanical uh, alignment. You know, periodically I always like to check, maybe one, once a week I'll throw an indicator on just to check and make sure the probe's not out, make sure I haven't banged it or bumped it or done anything silly. Uh, you know, that, that happens. My, my probe sits over here, and from time to time, uh, you know, if I'm pulling wires or something around, I'll grab the tip on it, and I'll know, okay, well, time to do a recal. But I think, I think that should get you guys up and running, uh, like I said, especially if you're using Probe Basic. And I think probably... Um, if you guys aren't getting those results, recheck alignment, recheck software calibration after alignment, and then be realistic with what your machine is, is capable of doing. Um, this machine is holding a tenth or two on the, on the repeatability with the probe. I can tell you the GO704 does not. Um, if I get plus or minus a thou on that machine, I'm, I'm happy. It's a different level machine. And the expectation that I have from that machine is realistic. Doesn't mean it doesn't make fantastic, beautiful parts. It just means that if I need more tolerance uh, capability, I'm gonna use the bigger machine. Um, and that's fine. This machine definitely did not cost what the GO704 costs. It takes up a significant amount of room. I don't know if you can... You know, that's, that's a far cry from a GO704 size-wise. Not everybody's going to have the space and room for that. So the machines will do what the machines will do. You can work on them, get them as good as you can. And when you get there, you know, if the result and the tolerance that it can hold is not satisfactory to you, it's, you probably should look at um, something a little, a little higher end than, than the GO704. If it is, and I, I'm going to say this, 
if you can get your machine to hold two thou, three thou, there's not a lot that that doesn't work for. I mean, the reality is three thousandths is very small. That's the width of a hair. Now, if you're trying to get into aerospace and you're trying to do it with a GO704, uh, you're going to have a tough time. Um, I, I wouldn't even try this machine for aerospace. You know, at that point, you're looking at a Morisaki and your, your, your cost investment to get that type of machine is going to be significantly higher. If you've got a small home shop and you're working on um, widgets or uh, you know items for who knows what, I, I make items for other machines. I make items for cars. Uh, I make items for dirt bikes, and I make items for friends. And ninety percent of the time, probably even ninety-eight percent of the time. Three thousandths tolerance is more than those parts need. Um, so, don't be discouraged, and don't don't beat yourself up if that's the type of tolerance you're, you're seeing. That is very respectable. You know, I, I see a lot of guys get super frustrated, super upset that they're at two or three thousandths, and they don't even know why they're upset, I feel, sometimes. I think a lot of times it's because if you have an indicator that reads in tenths, you know, a three throughout, a three thousand sweep looks huge. If you move over to a one thou indicator, you know, that's a tiny little bit. It's both the same amount, it's just one will make you feel a little worse about yourself and uh, one will make you feel like a hero so pick your battles understand your machine's capabilities and understand that if you have parts that you need higher tolerance on you know maybe not every part you make needs that high tolerance so you can outsource that one uh, and the ones that fall within your wheelhouse you know, those are the ones that will be your high money makers. Um, I, I outsource, I don't have broaching, so I outsource on the, uh, the spindles to have the spline, the splines cut in on an EDM. I don't have an EDM machine. I have a lathe, I have a big mill, I've got a little mill, I've got a little lathe, but... I, you know, if, if I had a tool for absolutely everything I could ever foresee needing, I, I would need a 50,000 square foot building probably. So pick your battles, be smart about what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, know when to send certain items out to a specialized company that can handle that for you. And um, the parts that you can make, Focus on making them beautiful, you know. 90% of people are very happy when they get a part and it's shiny and sparkly, you know. All, all the bling, is, it's nice. People enjoy putting nice looking things on their product. And if the parts are within two or three thou, and that's an acceptable tolerance for what that part's function and purpose is, that's great. There, there's nothing wrong with that. So instead of chasing the tents, Focus on other items, you know, um, making sure your, your spindle runouts low, making sure your coolant's clean, you've got good coolant, maybe work on an enclosure, um, work on what tooling you find best, work on your recipes for speeds and feeds and what gives you that great finish and what gives you the best tolerances. All that blends together. It's, it's a whole big working system. And it takes everything being as good as it can be to get the best result at the end. If you have a perfect machine and bad tooling or bad feeds and speeds, the machine won't compensate and make the part as good as it could be. So with that knowledge, focus on the things that you can 
fix and can make better and improve the system as a whole to reach the goals that we need to accomplish. I have found for me that is by far the most important uh, aspect of making parts on a CNC machine. Um, you guys may have some similar experiences I would imagine. So hopefully that helps you guys put, put things into perspective and um, you know I love machining. I love CNC. I love programming. I, I love working on the interface. I love making the parts. I love the sales aspect of it. I love dealing with customers who are, have a passion and a drive for similar things as myself. It's a very rewarding business to be in. It's a very rewarding hobby to have. Um, and hopefully you guys enjoy it as much as I do or if you're just getting into it you can get past any of these hurdles and get to the point where you start making sense of everything and getting those wins and, and uh, getting those accomplishments under your belt that give you the confidence to push forward and, and you know expand your knowledge and talents so hopefully this was informative and helpful and if you have any questions please leave a comment click the link to subscribe uh, check out our website www.smallshopconcepts.com or uh, you can find us on facebook on instagram give us a shoot us a message let us know what you're working on. Let us know if you need help with anything. You know, we have a passion for this just as much as you guys do. So we don't mind spending some time and talking with you and helping you sort things out. Uh, overall, I think that helps bolster the, the industry and the, and the growth of the hobby sector and the transition from hobby into small business. Uh, I, I know I leaned on so many people when I was on my way up and I try and give back as much as I can. So enjoy, take care, and thanks for watching, guys.